Hello everyone, uh, it's so nice to see you here. Uh, my name is Corin. I'm currently a PhD student at UC Riverside uh, under the guidance of the Professor Zhiyun Qian. So our group is actively researching on system security, especially for the Linux kernel. And my research mainly is focused on the kernel vulnerability and also the program analysis. So today I'm going to introduce our recent work, a hybrid alias analysis and this application to the Linux kernel. So this is the agenda. So the first, I will introduce the problem that we are working on, and also I will then introduce some background around that. And uh, finally, I will jump into the uh, program analysis world. So the motivation is that uh, we realize that many kernel access control mechanisms are rarely used because their rules are not easy to derive or the derived rules are actually not sound because the analysis themselves are not sound. But this might cause some wrong time issue if you have some false negative in your analysis. So to address that at a high level, we proposed a novel alias analysis framework that makes a precise, scalable, and sound alias analysis on the whole Linux kernel become real. Even we can analyze with the OES config Linux kernel, which turns on all possible modules, and it's quite large for analysis. So we also made many efforts to specifically support many Linux kernel code features, such as typecasting and point arithmetic, which are not well handled before in previous work. And eventually we have used our analysis to help derive access control rules for some existing kernel access control mechanisms, showing the promising results and uh, some improvements. So uh, for the background, so the kernel is uh, always under exploitation, most, mostly because of some memory safety bugs, such as the use of free and out of bound, or generally speaking, the dangling pointers that point to the place that it should never point to. And the kernel will crash because of the memory safety bugs, and, uh, but the exploitation will start from there. So one way to mitigate the kernel exploitation is to use the access control, which determines the access rights for a subject to an object, ideally following the principles of the least privilege. So we are all familiar with many high-level mechanisms, such as the user authentication or file operations, like the read-write execution, and some resource isolation mechanisms, like the namespace and the seccom. Uh, but let's think about it at the low level, so the program level, from the memory safety uh, perspective, or say the relationship between the pointers and their points to objects. So the most ideal access control here should follow the least memory safety privilege, which means the pointer should only access the permit, um, permitted memory objects, or a pointer or a memory object should only be accessed by the permitted um, pointers. So no dangling pointers that should point to the objects that they should never point to in the source code. So to achieve that, in practice, there are many access control mechanisms or prototypes. For example, the read-only memory page maintains the object that should never be accessed through a write. For example, the constant variables, that once you define a constant variable, you should never change its value uh, during the program execution. So, and many other mechanisms, we will introduce two of them uh, real quick. So the first is the read-only after initialization, or say the RO after init. It's a memory page-based mechanism that is used for protecting the global variables. We know that after the kernel compilation, a constant global variable will be put into the read-only section, since they are statically defined and would never be changed dynamically. But there are some other global variables that will only be initialized during the kernel boot and the kernel initialization. So uh, also it will not ne never be changed afterwards. So the RORP need is proposed to make such variables read only just right after the kernel initialization because it will never be changed uh, after the initialization. 
But the challenge is that it's hard to tell if a glue variable will be changed or not. Given the complex nature of the Linux kernel, it's hard to see that where does this glue variable, the address of it, for example, flows to. And it, it's also hard for developers to track the glue variables and confirm uh, all its changes only happens in the uh, initialization stage. So after six years of this mechanism being proposed, uh, about only 500 glue variables are manually tagged by the developers. And there are also some glue variables that are indeed could be changed after the kernel initialization. So for example, the mode probe path, which is a highly corrupted glue variable in many recent kernel exploits. So we cannot put it into the read-only section after, even after the initialization because it could be changed if we turn on the system control uh, config. But the truth is that uh, only few pointers in one single function of the system control module in the NIST kernel will modify it. And all of the exploits, for example, that are using the IPC, using the LED filters, corrupted it through those dangling pointers in those unrelated modules. So in other words, that if we can identify all the legal pointers that point to the mode probe path, we can figure out the illegal pointers and protect it through some pointer level access control. So we realized that the key building block to derive the memory level access control rule is alias or say the pointer analysis. So for example, that given a glue variable, if we can find all its points, pointer aliases, like to say that the, all the pointers that might point to it, and check if they are all used as read-only after the initialization, then we can confirm it could be RO after init. And also for more fine-grained access control, like we discussed before, alias analysis will naturally derive the points to set of the pointers and uh, of, of course the point, pointer set of the object. But in past decades, we have so many great works on the alias analysis. So why do we need yet another alias analysis? Well, the quick answer is that there is no good enough solution yet because all of them take different design trade-off. And none of them performs well for Linux kernel in the fundamental um, dimensions soundness, precision, and scalability. So the soundness means that there should never be true alias is missed, and precision means less false aliases. And also it's very important to be scalable to the whole Linux kernel, which is quite large with a reasonable precision. Uh, and also generally speaking, all of these analyses can be divided into two categories, data flow based and type based. So first, let me introduce the data flow based method. And now we are jumping to the program analysis. So assume there is a pointer in the P1 in the Linux kernel. So it could be the address of a glue variable or say point to the glue variable initially. So to figure out the aliases of this glue variable, we need to figure out where does P1 go to. So the data flow analysis is straightforward. It looks for the data flow of the P1 and eventually, if I figure out it flows to P2 and P3, uh, or say the P2 and P3 may point to the glue variable. Well, sometimes it's not that easy case. Actually, it will be much more complex in the Linux kernel. So the data flow might go through millions of nodes that are across many glue variables, heap objects, system calls, so on and so forth, make the situation much more complex and difficult. So intuitively, data flow analysis can only finish the analysis in a reason, or cannot finish the analysis in a reasonable time. So then we take a look at the type-based uh, alias analysis. So the type-based methods are more straightforward. It doesn't trace the data flow. Instead, it looks for the type of the variable, for example, the defined type. Uh, for example, assume the P1 is a structure A pointer. So with type-based analysis, it will directly derive that P2 to P5 as the aliases, since they share the same type. But P4 and P5 are false positives here, 
because there is no data flow between P1 to P4 or um, between P1 to P5. So you might think the, re uh, the result is reasonably good because it only introduces two false positives, but it could be a much worse in practice. So assume the P1 is now an integer pointer. It means that uh, millions of the integer pointers in the Linux kernel will be the aliases, which is definitely an unacceptable result. Well, there might be some type-based variants that try to refine the results based on some context. For example, here we uh, find some context one, context two, and to differentiate out some um, integer pointers. But uh, those type uh, analysis are based on the strong assumptions that are not always held in the Linux kernel, and things would be much worse due to the typecasting and some undefined language features and the result is still not acceptable. So it's too imprecise to use the Linux kernel. So in a summary, that the data flow-based analysis are more precise but less scalable, and the type-based methods are more scalable but less precise. So we hypothesize that there is a new solution space, which is relatively precise and relatively scalable. So that's where our solution is, the unions. So generally speaking, unions is a hybrid alias analysis that combines data flow analysis and type analysis. So we will illustrate our idea with a simple example here. So still start from the P1. At the beginning, we are in data flow mode to trace the data flow. But instead of tracing the data flow all the way down, we look for a suitable time to change. So for example, at the node N1, which is a structure B pointer with the insight from the type-based methods, just like taking a shortcut, we switch to type mode and teleport the data flow to other structure B pointer nodes and continue the data flow there. So it's worth noting that the data flow from P1 to N1 is not a trivially an integer pointer cast to a structure B pointer. It could be the case that P1 is actually a integer pointer field of the structure B. And correspondingly, the, those teleport terminals are also the same field of the structure B. And for example, P2 is a structure field of the structure B and N2. So at the high level, we do data flow analysis by default. Meanwhile, we look for a good chance to take the type-based shortcut. And then we continue the data flow analysis afterwards And more interestingly, there is actually a more precise strategy. So this, is, this time we won't choose to take the shortcut at the N1. And instead, that uh, we keep tracking the data flow. When at the N4, <coughs> which is a structure C pointer, we can choose to take the shortcut by the structure C and potentially get a more precise result. One of the precise reasons is because that a structure C is less commonly used than structure B. So taking the shortcut of the structure C goes to less nodes, which just means that it's more precise and it will get more, get more precise results. So in the extreme case, that if we don't take any shortcut, the analysis will fall back to a purely data flow based analysis. So it shows that a UNIS is not a simple alias analysis. It's actually an adjustable and unified framework that allows you to have different data flow and type strategies and achieve different trade-off in terms of the precision and the scalability. So in addition to that, UNIAS also provides customization for different variables since it's a per-variable analysis, meaning that you should always give an input variable to start your query or to start your search. That allows you to apply different strategies to different variables and tasks. So for example, that some variables may need a more precise readout that require more data flow analysis and you also have the freedom to do that. So let's go back to the insight. So we now know the key is the structure field, which we collapse the same structure type fields to be connected. And then we can teleport our data flow from one to others. Such a strategy is actually an over-approximation, since there might not be a true data flow between the same type field nodes. 
But we can still improve the precision given the adjustable framework. As we just discussed before, we can choose to take the shortcut through the less commonly used structure types to limit the search space. And also we can adjust, try to try more data flow, just to try more before taking the shortcut. So in the previous case, the precision is improved not only because we choose the less common type structure C, but also we do more data flow before the shortcuts. Such a data flow constraint requires a, a, a symmetric data flow after the shortcuts. So for example here, before the structure C, we have the data flow constraint as the P1 is stored to a structure B field, and the structure, structure B is from a structure C field after the structure C shortcut, I mean after the teleport, we also look for the same structure C to B field and also a loud instruction from the structure B field. So since we store something before, which is necessary to match a loud afterwards. So you could imagine there might be three instructions on the left, a store instruction on the left, and correspondingly, they, they requires three loud instructions on the right. So you always need to make the asymmetric balance. So in other words, if, even if we take a very common structures as the shortcut, when we choose to have more data flow constraint before, we can expect less matched data flow afterwards, which is still precise. And we, when we, we try to handle some kernel specific code features. So the first is the typecast. So when dealing with types, we always need to handle the typecasting especially in the Linux kernel, which has a bunch of the cast. For example, here in the source code that there is a typecast from structure A to structure B, in which case, if we want to take the shortcut through the structure A, we need to also take care of the structure B because there is a typecast. Well, traditionally, type-based methods handle it through a union find strategy. They will do a linear scan of all the typecast instructions in the whole kernel and consider the type that once cast to each other to collapse to the same type. Thus, it will, in this case, consider the use of the structure B as the use of structure A. And thus, would derive P3, P4, and P5 are aliases of P1. However, in Unius, we have a more precise solution we also scan all cast instructions, but instead of um, collecting the equivalence at the type level, we collect it at the object level, which means that we will only jump to, only teleport to the exact pointer that experienced this cast instruction. So here is the A3 to B1. So the data flow analysis will only continue from the B1 and then derive P3 as the alias. And if there are indeed a data flow between B1 to B2 or between the B1 to B3, the data flow analysis would also automatically trace it and handle it. But in this case, there are not. So it does need to do so and the result is more precise and is exactly the ground truth. So there are many undefined uh, code features used in the Linux kernel source code. So mostly the pointer arithmetic. Instead of assuming they are not existed, we chose to address them through some formal strategies. So for example, due to the type casting, a structure type, a structure object might be accessed through different type of pointers, even through some void star pointers. So in which case, if you want to match such field access, for example, match at the left and match at the right, we need to normalize them into the byte offset instead of the field indices because different field indices in different types might access the same memory offset in the object. And we also relax the field arithmetic rules for the Linux kernel because, uh, for example, we allow the field arithmetic from the field to base and even we allow the negative offset of the field access. So a, a typical case here is the container of which essentially access the structure base from the field through a void star point arithmetic. So it's worth noting that uh, unlike many previous works that try to handle the container of specifically, 
through some model. Unius naturally handles it through the formal handling of the pointer cast and the pointer arithmetic. So we didn't specifically handle it, but uh, by handling these two code features, we automatically handle the container off. So the Unius could handle more pointer arithmetic or so undefined behaviors in practice. And we design and implement our analysis based on the grammar of the context-free reachability framework, which solves the analysis as a graph reachability problem. So for example, if you give me a pointer that I can, through the graph reachability research on the graph, I can tell you the points to object of this pointer. Or if you give me a memory object node on the graph, I can search the pointers for you. So UNES seamlessly unifies the data flow and type uh, alias analysis, and is sound by design. Uh, that's why also it's called the UNIS, so unified the alias. So it also handles the multi-entry nature of the Linz kernel through the flow insensitive analysis, which means that a different system call execution orders don't affect the uh, data flow results. And uh, our results is always conservatively approximated beyond the uh, system call execution order. And as mentioned before, it's an on-demand per variable analysis. So you can choose different strategies for different variables to achieve different trade-off of the, of the precision and the scalability. But there are still some limitations in the UNIS. So for example, first some undefined code behaviors rather than the pointer arithmetic that we mentioned before. The kernel developers even write the code in a way that cast a pointer to an integer and cast that back to a pointer somewhere else. So the reason is that they don't want to accidentally dereference the pointers during the propagation or, do, or they try to do some pointer arithmetic through the integer arithmetic. But since the UNIS work on the SVF, uh, which is a static analysis framework based on LVM IR. So we only work on the SVF pointer assignment graph, which is a data flow graph provided by SVF, which would only represents the pointers, not the integers so far. Thus that it <coughs> cannot recognize such arithmetic and handle it. So it might be some feature work, future work. And there are many inline assembly code in the NIS kernel, which are not represented semantically in the LVM IR. So some potential solutions are trying to model the assembly code as some external APIs, or try to lift them to the LVM IR through some decompiling strategies. And also the on-demand analysis somehow limited the scalability of the UNIS. So even though the UNIS search in the search space of the UNIS is the whole kernel code space, but it's not like a whole program analysis, which will analysis the whole program at first and the query for the results afterwards. Instead, the UNIS needs to query first and start the analysis on demand. So start the graph search after you query the things. Thus, if you query more variables, it will be more time consuming because you need to spend more time. But it's uh, fully parallelizable. So if you have enough CPU cores and uh, threads that you can uh, get a, a good scalability. So we've, we, we evaluated our analysis on some applications. For example, the ROR for init mechanism that we mentioned before. So as a result, UNIS can analysis all 12,000 global variables in the Linux kernel version 5.14 with a default configuration in one hour time budget. So where the Anderson based data for analysis can only analyze about 3,000, so one fourth of the UNIS. And showing the UNIS is more scalable than the data flow based methods. Also compared to the type based methods, UNIS can protect six times more glue variables by identifying them as R of init because type-based are too approxim over approximation to use, meaning that a UNIS is more precise than the type-based methods. So as a result, that a UNIS find about 10 times of the protectable glue variables than previous human efforts 
So we tested the result by a two weeks fuzzing and confirm only few ne false negatives are introduced due to the limitation that we discussed before, the inline assembly code or the point to integer. So that's, there are still some improvement space here, and we are also researching on some strategies to decrease the false negatives in practice. But the design itself is still sound, so we do need to handle some implementation level details. And we also tested uh, uh, about the tunability of uh, the UNIS. So by setting the different shortcut strategy, for example, taking the shortcut more aggressively, we do improve the scalability of the UNIS, but also sacrifice the precision a little bit. And go back to the highly exploited glue variable, the multiple path. Well, the ground truth is that it will have three pointer aliases in one C file. C code file and the UNIS find 19 pointers in six C files, which slightly over approximates the truth. But no matter what is good enough for preventing all related exploits. As a comparison, that data flow based methods find 11 pointers in four C files, while the type based methods find millions of the pointers because the multiple path glue variable is actually a character array glue variable, which is essentially a void star pointer in the LVM IR. So we also apply the UNIS to protect the glue variable with the two mechanisms, our offering it and the general software fault isolation. So to our best knowledge in the recent six years, there are about 13 out of the 37, so one third of the open exploits once leveraged the glue variables. And as a result, the UNIS derived that all of those exploits are using illegal pointers. So if we apply the access control mechanism through the rules derived by UNIS, we can prevent them all. And there are also many other potential applications for the UNIS. So for example, to derive the rules for the access control mechanisms, such as the pointer authentication and write integrity, which still need some derive of the access control rule automatically. Also for the general program analysis, given that the alias analysis or say the pointer analysis is actually a very basic building block of almost all program analysis, such as the tain analysis and maybe some bug finding analysis, because UNIS is much more precise. So even if you are, <coughs> and even if you are not even if you are not doing anything around the program analysis, you might still benefit from UNIS. You can still try it when you're writing the code for the Linux kernel. Because you might wonder the potential points to set given a pointer or find the pointers given an object in the Linux kernel source code. So feel free to try it. So it, it should be a, a tool that helps you to figure out the pointer and the object relationship. So to summarize in this work, we propose a novel alias analysis framework that principally unifies the data flow based and type based methods. It is sound by design and can adjust the precision and scalability and can apply to different variables and tasks on your demand. We apply the UNIS to analysis the use of glue variables. So then we prevent all the glue variable related exploits in recent six years with the suitable mechanism, access controls. So eventually that we find the UNIS in the solution space. And that's it for my presentation. Thanks everyone for your time. Any questions? At Google, we find that static analyses are, are best uh, understood at code review time. And for that to work, you need it to be pretty stable under change. Have you d seen if uh, analyzing the kernel at different points in its history provide a fairly consistent view of uh, the same variables that have existed in previous versions? Oh, you mean 
Can we support the incremental analysis somehow? No. I'm talking about uh, how um, flexible under refactorings the analysis is because whenever you're tuning a static analysis, it can be very finicky and that finickiness, just because you added extra curly braces or not, um, can make it uh, unsuitable for including in the software development life cycle. Okay, so uh, one thing that I want to mention that we also tried our uh, static analysis always on the most recent Linux kernels. So it should be uh, suitable for if the Linux kernel get update. And also the framework itself is writing in a very brief uh, way so that uh, developers can easily add or delete any logic that uh, on the framework. And the framework itself is basically a depth first search. You could think about it like that. So that is uh, quite easy and friendly for developers to, to work on that. Uh, yeah. um, you said you found uh, 5,000 instances where we can mark read-only after init. Uh, are, are we expecting some patches uh, as output from this? Mm. Yeah, this is a really good question. So, but but uh, uh, indeed, that uh, well, the one truth is that if you can check our paper, uh, we mentioned that we find uh, 5,000, but there are still 23 false negatives, and uh, all of them because of the inline assembly code and also the point to integer. And since the R of init, if you really mark them as the read only, is quite dangerous because <laughs> you know after the initialization, if some variable is read only and some legitimate code access it, it just crash the kernel. So we. Uh, we would like to suggest that developers could use our results to and uh, double check for that. That um, could be a, a better strategy. But since there are many in, implementation level dirty things that uh, actually for the static analysis for the kernel, so uh, it's not that safe to do so. Okay. Is, the, is that list easily accessible? A list of 5,000 places that maybe we could use? Mm. You mean if the result is acceptable, the false negative? Uh, like, ratio? is that is the list published somewhere that someone can actually sit down and look at each of those and say, yeah. Oh this yeah, is we, we 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 are going to uh, release that. Okay, great. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. I have another question. Uh, you have a claim of soundness in order for you to, to prove a mathematical property about a programming language, you need the semantics as a mathematical object. Which one are you using for C? Uh, you mean the semantic improvement of the soundness or? In order to be a sound analysis, that's a mathematical statement over mathematical objects. And for here, you have a semantics of a programming language, perhaps C. Where is that model? What model did you base this off? Uh, so the things that are actually for the most of the C um, language features that, uh, or say that all of the C language feature, if you indeed follow the code feature or the uh, behavior, that uh, we should already handle that. But the only exception is those undefined code future. Like you do some uh, force arithmetic on the pointers or on the integers and turn it to, into a pointer, which is quite complex for the pointer analysis. And it's still an open problem for general um, program analysis because the soundness is always based on some assumption or just like you said, some uh, uh, semantic or uh, some model. And we can confirm that under the most of the uh, about most of the code features we handled them, but uh, there are indeed many, not many, a few implementation level things that are uh, really tough. So your model you've you've built from the ground up, or you're or you're taking it from somewhere else, 
for example, uh, comp cert has an entire big step semantics uh, specified in COP uh, for C. And that is the kind of model that I'm talking about as a mathematical object. Okay, that sounds some specific thing that I am I not very familiar with. And we can discuss maybe offline about that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, that's pretty much it for the presentation. Thank you. Everyone.